So I'd like to start off this presentation by explaining a central premise surrounding the interaction of nanoparticles with serum proteins and how that um, interaction starts to mediate their physiological response. So this is a central paradigm in this type of research uh, activities. So typically when we make nanoparticles, we make them in a three net flask or some sort of a chemical reaction chamber. And when we make these nanoparticles, we tend to characterize their physical chemical properties. So we measure the size of the par particles, we measure the surface chemistry of the particles, we can measure the shape of the particles, as well as the zeta potential. So when we have these characterizations in place, we call them the synthetic or chemical identity of the nanoparticle. However, when you take these nanoparticles and you inject it into a patient, the nanoparticles inject, interact with uh, serum proteins and entities. And so in this case, the nanoparticle starts to be coated with proteins, which is shown here, or depicted in the, uh, the green or the nanoparticle starts to aggregate in small little clusters. So they can aggregate as dimers, trimers, tetramers, so they tend to aggregate in small little clusters. So this new surface chemistry around the nanoparticle is now called the biological identity of the nanoparticle. So whatever you start off with has an impact in terms of what proteins are broke onto the surface. But at the end of the day, it's these surfaces or proteins that starts to interact with the cells that uh, that the nanoparticles, as the nanoparticles are traveling the body. So this is the interface. So the cell only sees the, uh, the, uh, the proteins that go to the surface or whether it's a dimer, trimer, tetramer, and so on. So these nanoparticles may be interacting with the receptors and starts a new signaling cascade, or the nanoparticles get taken up, and then when it gets taken up, it can also induce some sort of signaling uh, cascade. So there's an uh, indirect correlation between the chemistry of the particles to synthesize versus the, uh, the final physiological response. And researchers in this area are trying to figure out what these serum proteins are doing between the particles and the final biological response. They're trying to map this interaction and trying to correlate the chemistry with the proteins with the physiological response. So, this area of research has been pretty hot for the last 15 to, to 20 years, but this area of research started long before we started calling uh, the proteins that absorb onto the surface the protein corona or the biological identity. So I'd like to start off by defining some of these terminologies. So before 2000, as early as the 1960s, it's been well known that we take nanomaterials and you inject into the body that serum proteins that absorb onto the surface. So at that time, these absorbed proteins were called opsonins because these proteins were uh, implied to be involved with an immune response of nanomaterials. Around 2007, uh, Professor Dawson at uh, UC Dublin started naming these proteins absorbed onto the surface as the protein corona. So the protein corona involves both the immune activating proteins as well as other proteins. So this term became much broader in terms of description of the proteins that absorb onto the surface. And in 2011, we decided to call this the biological identity. And the reason for that is because we speculated that proteins absorb to our surface, but other things such as ions, lipids, and other types of adsorbate can also put, uh, be absorbed to the surface. In addition, the nanoparticles may exist as a multifaceted structure dimers and trimers. And so the morphology also changes of the nanoparticle. And so these particular activities of uh, different molecules absorbing surface as well as morphology cannot be explained just by using the term protein corona. As time goes on, the term continues to evolve and I'll explain that in a few minutes. So the proteins that are absorbed onto a surface can be defined as a hard or soft protein corona. And so these terms are defined by the Dawson group. And so what ends up happening is that you have a nanoparticle. And so when you have a nanoparticle, you have proteins that immediately absorb onto the surface, which is shown by this curve. So the proteins absorb onto the surface and that's through time, it starts to form an equilibrium. And the proteins that have the highest or strongest binding to the surface or nanoparticle is defined as the hard corona. So it's this layer that's the hard corona. Proteins that are weakly bound above the hard corona is defined as a soft corona. And the soft corona is usually defined with a K value that is very weak. 
right? So that means that it comes to the surface and then slowly desorbs out. The desorption kinetics are very similar as well for the soft corona. It quickly removes from the surface and eventually forms an equilibrium. The hard corona contains proteins that are very difficult to desorb on the surface, but the K value has not been fully defined at this particular point. It's just generally defines hard corona something that's very hard to fall off the surface or desorb from the surface, and a soft corona something that's easy. So the study from Dawson's group also showed that if you start to change the chemistry of your nanoparticles, here, by changing the, the uh, ratio of the polymers, what you essentially see is that they actually have a different adsorption and desorption rate, which is reflected by the different color curves. So what we thought in recently was that it's actually very, it's not descriptive enough to say hard and soft corona because it doesn't explain what's really going on on the surface of the nanoparticle. So in this recent paper, we start to define the, uh, the coronal layer with more specificity. So we define that as three layers, a foundation layer, an assembly layer, and a binding layer. So proteins can absorb onto the surface of the nanoparticles. In some cases, some of the proteins tend to be one protein just sticking out from the surface. In other cases, you may have a protein that first adsorbs, and then what you have is another protein that binds and adsorbs onto the surface of that particle. And then you have other cases where you have almost a sandwich structure where you have a protein that's to the surface, it binds onto some other protein, and then you have another protein that binds onto another epitope onto this protein. So we call it the assemble layer because assembling between two different proteins. Um, while the final target to bind to, let's say, cells, tissues, maybe the uh, the proteins that's presenting on the further on the farthest away from the nanoparticle. So in this case, it would be this protein, or it could be this protein. So it's the outermost protein that's potentially interacting with cells. So that's one of our hypotheses we have. So one of the things that we noticed is that the serum protein adsorption is highly variable. So this is an experiment we did in 2012, and it was published in 2014. So in this particular set of experiment, we synthesize 100, over 150 different formulations of whole nanoparticle. And we actually took all 150 formulations, placed it on a shelf for one month to ensure that we are working with only mild dispersed nanoparticles. So when we put in the shelf, any formulation <coughs> that was um, aggregated after one month, we would not use for this particular set of study. So we ended up with about 70 to 75 different formulations that were mild dispersed after one month. So we took these nanoparticles, we incubated with serum for an hour, and then afterward we purified the gold nanoparticle, we digested the gold, and then we used mass spec to measure the proteins that absorb onto the surface of the nanoparticles. And this formulation is shown here, and the proteins absorb is shown here. But what is interesting, not the specific formulation and the mass not the specific proteins that absorb to the surface, it's actually the patterns of proteins that absorb. And what we found is that there are no two formulations that yielded the exact same patterns of proteins that absorb on the surface. And these particles were all synthesized in the same time frame, characterized in the same time frame, and then there's huge variable proteins that absorb on the surface. And so what this also tells us is really important because when you're essentially making a formulation, if a formulation is not standardized, what's going to happen is that you may have different proteins absorbed to the surface, which may have downstream impact that you may not be aware of um, from the, from the get-go. And just to show you two examples from another paper we show, is that if you coat the surface of your gold nanoparticle with different peg densities, you will have, based on the density, different amount of a certain protein. So in this case, an antigen you have a lot of collagen absorbed onto the surface when you have a high peg per nanometer square, a high density of peg, as compared to complement C3. So if you have very low peg density, you have a high amount of your protein being complement C3, but as you start to increase the peg density, you start seeing less and less C3. So again, in addition to what we saw in the Dalton paper, this shows that the surface chemistry has an impact in terms what type of proteins adsorb to the surface, as well as how much of that protein is adsorbed to the surface. But based on that study, even though we, the patterns of proteins vary based on, based on design, what we did see was that in a general case, when you looked at so many formulations, 
is that most of the nanoparticles we saw 71 plus or minus 22 distinct proteins absorbed onto the gold nanoparticle surface. We always see that the surface charge became negative charge. So if you start off with cationic nanoparticle, you start off with a neutral nanoparticle, a gold nanoparticle, you at the end will get a slightly negative uh, nanoparticle surface. The other thing that we actually saw in those uh, earlier studies in 2014 is that when we measure the nanoparticles after we watched it a bunch of times, we always see an increase of 15 nanometer radius in the size of the nanoparticle. So that means it's like you start off with a 30 nanometer nanoparticle, by the time it's circulating in the body, it's likely to be 60 nanometers or larger. So you add 15 nanometers on each side, and then you may have a soft corona that absorbs onto the surface. So you actually have a relatively large nanoparticle that it, that's traveling in the body. We also found that if you have a small nanoparticle that's let's say less than six nanometers, it may actually ride the protein. So if your protein is let's say 10 to 15 nanometers, that small nanoparticle actually binds onto the, the protein, the larger protein, and then it essentially travels along with it. So, so this is sort of the basic theme of what we know now in terms of the, the nanoparticle uh, protein corona. So this is the general overview. And as I mentioned, this field of research has been around for over 60 years. And it's only gained a lot of steam probably the last 15 years. And that's because uh, there's been a lot of very interesting questions. So these questions actually were posed in the 1980s and, and 1990s, but they start to resurface again. And the reason for that is because nanoparticles are finding a lot of different applications in medicine. And these are, are kind of normal questions, but very good questions, but haven't been answered. So some of the interesting questions that we see are, does the protein corona composition mediate cellular association, right? So I present an overview of what we think, but there's not a lot of evidence at this particular point that there's this relationship, and that's still a question. And if so, can you predict the cellular interaction or association using the protein corona? So if you know the, the proteins that are done in the first surface, can you use this to predict how the nanoparticles are transporting in the body, body and what cells they're interacting with? The second question is, does the protein corona composition mediate in vivo behavior? So if you start to inject a nanoparticle in the body, how does the protein corona composition dictate where the nanoparticles go or what cells interact with? And if you know that, can you then develop a way to predict the in vivo distribution using the protein corona? The third one and the fourth one that people are starting to think about is how do you solve the nanoparticle serum protein issue? Because right now it feels like there's a lot of these processes, uh, absorption processes are rather random. So the question is that if it's random, how do you actually control it to allow it to, uh, allow it to help your nanoparticles target or bind to specific cells? And the last one is what can you use the serum protein absorption for? So the nanoparticles do pick up a unique set of proteins that may be different than the, uh, than the composition of the serum itself. So then the question then becomes is that, can you use the, nano, uh, the serum protein absorption patterns as a predictor for something else, right? And so in 2005, I just wanted to give a little history of how we started doing this. So we published a study which showed that the size and the shape of gonadal particles affect how much they get into mammalian cells. And it's very clear that there's just short size and shape effect. And the way we explained it is by this sort of really rough data in 2005, where we actually show that the gonadal particles absorb onto serum proteins, right? And so this is an IR spectra of pure nanoparticle versus one exposed to uh, proteins, a shift in the, uh, the absorbance spectra, a change in the gel um, of the gonadal particles, as well as when you start to measure the, uh, the, the, the surface chemistry of the nanoparticles, once you're exposed to serum, you can actually use this color acid to show that there's serum on the surface. So in 2005, when we published this paper in 2006, we attributed some of these size and shape dependent interaction in nanoparticles or mammalian cells to the serum proteins. And at that time, we don't actually know what that protein is or was. So let's look at the first question. And the first question is, does the, the protein current composition mediate cellular association? So the way we did the study is pretty straightforward. And this is going to be a common theme of how we've been doing studies for the last seven years in this particular topic. 
So what we did is we made a library of nanoparticles. And so my lab tends to work a lot on go nanoparticles. And the reason we use go nanoparticles for these types of studies is because we can centrifuge the nanoparticles because they're so dense. So pose it down to the bottom of the centrifuge tube, and then we can act, we can remove the excess uh, serum proteins that are absorbed that active proteins that are not absorbed to the surface of the nanoparticle. So we make a library of nanoparticles. We incubate them in serum. So the proteins absorb to the surface, which is demonstrated here. And then we purify them using centrifugation. And we split the, these nanoparticles into two sets of experiments. In one set of experiment, we take the nanoparticles, digest them, and then we have proteins now in solution, and we run mass spectrometry on the uh, the, uh, the proteins. So that tells us what proteins are absorbed on the surface. The other half of proteins uh, that are absorbed on the surface, we incubate those with cells and we measure the amount of these nanoparticles that are bound to the cells as well as taken up into the cells. So right now we don't differentiate whether they're bound or they're taken up. So that's what we use the term association, the particles associating with the cell system. And so we get that data. Then what we do is that we use a mathematical algorithm to try to correlate the protein absorbed to the surface with the data of the nanoparticle being taken up by the cells. And so we can actually create a, a, a function that allows to relate Y, which is the proteins, with F of X, which the X refers to the, versus the, uh, the cell uptake. So in the cell experiments, what we have done is that use principal component analysis, which allows us to organize the, uh, the mass spec data into basically a single a parameter or maybe two parameters, as well as that. So it allows us to do a Y relating to, uh, y relating to X. So what we found is that if you use the entire data set, uh, you can see a correlation, and the correlation is pretty good. It's about 0.6 to 0.8. Usually we achieve about 0.8 uh, correlation. To, to give you a sense of what the uh, the top level of association is, it's usually approximately one. So it's kind of like an R squared. So if you look at Pearson uh, coefficient, one means that there's a perfect correlation, point zero, or zero means there's no correlation, 0.5 is okay, but 0.67 or 8 usually shows that there's a good association. So then we can actually see that there's a good relationship between the protein corona, what is bound to the surface versus the cellular association. And then once it generates an equation, we can actually simulate and then create a relationship between protein corona as a function of, of a cellular association. And this is shown by the, by the, the, the green dots here. So you can actually cross correlate what you measure versus the predicted. And you can see that there is a direct relationship. So how equation can actually predict uh, whether um, the nanoparticle will be taken out very efficiently using an equation versus the actual experiment. And then we actually use the same kind of mathematics to look at other parameters to predict correlation. And so we call this a protein corona fingerprint. And that's approximately 0.8, as, we, as I mentioned before. If you look at things like the zeta potential, the dynamic light stack scattering, I don't quite remember what ES is, but uh, dynamic light scattering, transmission electron microscopy, which measures size, as well as the amount of proteins, you see that the protein corona is actually a better predictor of cellular association than any of these single variables. So when we finished the study, we actually thought that um, the size to shape chemistry is, uh, is, a, is very difficult to sort of correlate these three parameters for cell association. But what the protein corona depicts is a combination of these multi-facet uh, parameters in terms of prediction. So it's a one parameter instead of using multiple physical chemical parameters in terms of determining the relationship. But what was interesting in this study is we, have, we measured to see the gold nanoparticle that we use in the study, whether the data we obtain or correlation obtain can be used to also predict for other nanoparticle type, right? So if we just use and so we, the way we did this, we are compared the, the data for the gold nanoparticle and try to use that to predict the silver nanoparticle in terms of interactions or uptakes with their cells or cell association with silver nanoparticles. And what we saw is that if you just make the library of gold nanoparticle prediction, you see very low predictions, so 0.045. And what it shows is that the gold nanoparticle is not able to predict the silver nanoparticle cell association. So now if you make the same experiment with silver nanoparticles, 
and you look at the cell association, you see a very similar uh, correlation, point, approximately 0.8 gold nanoparticles for itself. And if you try to mix the data between gold nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles, you also see a very low prediction. Right? So what this does is that if we use gold nanoparticle, it only can predict its association with cells. Silver nanoparticles only with the uh, with uh, their shells, but you can combine the two. So this suggests that in order for us to develop a library of prediction of cellular behavior of nanoparticles, we would actually have to, to analyze each nanoparticle separately. We did silver, we did gold, but lipid nanoparticles, you would have to do this, uh, develop this library. Polymer nanoparticles, you have to develop this library, metal oxides, as well as silicon nanoparticles. So this is a list of six different nanoparticles. And then you have to go through the same kind of methodology that we did with gold nanoparticles. Characterize the physical, the chemical properties, measure the cellular association, or measure a response that gives you an outcome. And you take that outcome data, and then you model this, and you develop this correlation curve. And that will allow you to predict the outcome for that particular particle type. But if you create a large enough library, we think we can actually use that to, to predict generally what nanoparticles do in terms of cell interaction, cell uptake. So once we've established that principle, we adapted that principle to answer the second question. Um, that should be question number two, which is, does the protein corona composition, composition mediate the in vivo behavior, which is what was always our interest, but we started to sell work because it's a much simpler system to allow us to do this uh, correlation relationship. And as you can see, the experiment is very similar, except for now we take the nanoparticle, we inject it into the animal, the particles circular around different time points, and what we do is we collect the blood or we resect the organ at different time frame. And so when we collect the blood, we run through what we do cell association um, and a study is that we actually do a pro protein analysis. So we actually measure the proteins absorbed to the surface of the nanoparticles at a different time point. Or you do organ resection and we do the same thing. So we, because we're using gold particle, we use the technique of ICP mass spec to measure the amount of nanoparticles that are absorbed onto the surface of nanoparticles. So we can determine the amount of distribution, we can determine the amount of nanoparticles taken up at that particular organ. And then what we do is we correlate these two uh, data, the protein absorbed versus the bound distribution patterns of the nanoparticles. And the way we did this correlation is by using a uh, machine learning algorithm to correlate liver and the spleen and the half-life uptake um, with the proteins that absorb to the surface. Uh, what we found in this particular study is that the protein corona uh, prediction, we cannot use principal component analysis. And the reason for that is because it gets a lot more complicated in an in vivo system. So we have to move to a uh, machine learning algorithm because it allows us to correlate um, multi variables pretty easily and pretty quickly. Um, between, between the, um, the, the Proteins absorbed to surface with the uh, bio distribution pattern. And this is to show you again, same thing what we did with the cell association, is that using the algorithm we generated from the neural network, we can predict the, the distribution, the half life, the spleen accumulation, and the liver accumulation versus the real measured sample. So this is again shown real measurement versus predicted. So it spits out a number. And again, we can easily predict that you using the algorithm here. So the question is that since we can predict the algorithm in terms of how the particles distribute in the liver and spleen, as well as the half-life, the question is what proteins are responsible for the pharmacokinetic behavior of the nanoparticles that we saw? And the answer is we don't know. And so we actually mapped the two, four, six, eight, nine most prevalent proteins, and they're all over the place. So we were not able to determine which proteins may be involved, and it's likely a multitude of proteins that may be involved in this particular process. And so the sub-questions that we're asking now is that what receptors, so we don't think it's a single receptor, uh, may be involved, and what ligands on the nanoparticles may be involved. So they're receptor ligand pairing that mediates the nanoparticle cell interaction. So the key work that we're trying to figure out at this point, one of the key work is to identify the receptors that are involved in nanoparticle interaction as it relates to the um, proteins that absorbed onto the surface. And so that's a big, big, big project, which we're just starting to work on at this point. And the first thing we have to do was actually to look at the ligands, right? And so the ligands 
are from the uh, protein corona. And we're trying to figure out which one of these proteins may be involved in the, um, the binding to the receptor. And that's the starting point. And the experiments we do was designed by Johnny Zhang, who's in the, uh, uh, the Anonymous and Innovation Network. And this experiment is um, pretty straightforward, right? Where we actually take a tube and we coat the tube with, um, uh, with a positive charge. So we use positive lysine. And then when we have polyisin, we absorb the nanoparticle onto the surface. And after we absorb it onto the surface, we now mix it with an antibody, and the antibody has a biotin on the surface. So if the antibody binds onto proteins on the surface, it'll get stuck on the surface. Then we wash off, and we can now add an avidin with a contrast peroxidase. So you can have a color change. So this is the experiment we did. So this is for one protein absorbed to the surface. And so what we did was we actually did a large screen. So we actually took the omic data, identified 60, 80 different proteins that may potentially be targeted. And after we identified those 60, 80 proteins, we then screened, um, screened those proteins against the uh, particles that dr. surface to identify the proteins that's bound. And we found that there's approximately um, about 20 or 22 different proteins that were binding to the target. And again, the specific proteins doesn't really matter at this point. But what we were trying to figure out at first was how many proteins that are on the surface will actually bind to the surface receptor or bind to a matching pair. And what we found is that there are certain proteins that are very dominant, like these two proteins, FE and FN, and AT3, a lot of them are actually complement uh, proteins, or uh, proteins that are involved in immune response. But what we found is that only 0.7% of the proteins that are absorbed on the surface of the nanoparticle would have a binding to a target uh, protein. So the suggests is that even though when the nanoparticle is circling, it may have hundreds of proteins that are absorbing onto the surface, only 20% of those proteins can bind to a receptor target. And so this is the first set of experiment to, to show this. So not all proteins are involved in binding to their receptor part. So that's what we are in terms of that work. And I, I want to talk about the future of this field. So right now, we know that serum proteins absorb to nanoparticle surface or surfaces. We know that there is a diverse set of proteins that absorb to the surface. We know that nanoparticle size, shape, surface chemistry, and chemical composition influence the surface absorbed protein pattern. So we know that all these things matter. But the thing is that we don't actually know how even though this, there's a lot of work in the field, a lot of, lots of papers published, the mechanism, the details of how these things mediate the uh, absorption of corona is still not fully worked on. So there are several challenges that are happening in the field at this particular point, right? So the first challenge is to need to understand the relationship between the material type, protein absorption, in vivo behavior, and cell association. So there needs to be a greater understanding between these relationships. There's bits and pieces in the literature, but there's not a clear sort of link relationship yet. And one of the challenges is actually the requirement for the development of new analytical techniques. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you are working with liposome, and you try to uh, purify the free proteins from serum versus that of uh, absorbed onto the liposome, it's really difficult to do because when you centrifuge, the liposome gets centrifuged down, and then you have the serum protein, which can also centrifuge down. And so there's these two really nice studies that just came out recently, 2020 and 2021, that talked about the limitations of using centrifugation for, uh, for, uh, for your study in liposomes, uh, protein corona liposomes. And this particular study is a very nice study that was published by a group in China, which shows that you have to use a penny column chromatography as a purification step for you to not mistaken your proteomics study or your proteomics of for the protein that's absorbed on surface versus that in uh, in solution. Challenge two is really the issue of the reproducibility of the protein corona profiling. So when you actually do the analysis, it varies significantly from sample to sample, and it can also vary from uh, from people to people. Uh, so that's something that has to be figured out at this point <laughs> in terms of the protein corona profiling. And this has the impact in some of the applications that we'll be talking about down the line. So the, in order to solve this reproducibility issue, there needs to be a, a more thorough analysis of the kinetics and the physical chemical behavior of proteins absorbed onto the nanoparticle surface. 
So despite the fact that we, you know, through this figure, we have a fast versus um, slow adsorption, a slow desorption, and a fast adsorption, one of the things that's limited in the field is the understanding of what's a binding affinity. So the binding of the hard corona, the proteins that's on the surface, there's probably a certain K value that's associated with it. And that K value will help, will determine, will tell us whether that those proteins form in equilibrium or not on the surface. So there's need to be a thorough analysis of kinetics, physical chemical behavior uh, of the proteins that broke to the surface of the particle. The third challenge, and this is kind of a funny one, I was debating to put this or not, there are actually too many review articles on protein corona at this particular point. Um, these review articles have provided so many claims on what the corona is, and as well as the biological identity, it has claims of all these uh, sort of uh, physiological response and behavior. And the problem is that the original research articles haven't caught up with the review articles. So the review articles are saying one thing, the original research papers on this topic hasn't caught up to sort of the claims of the, uh, the review articles. So we're actually not sure if some of these claims are true or not until more studies are done. Um, you know, this causes the false sense of the field in the sense that we don't actually know what can the corona do and not do, right? Now we're gonna discuss this a little bit in terms of some of the application aspects of corona. So because of these uh, challenges, um, it's, it needs to be done, but it will be figured out probably in the next few years. But the other thing I want to actually talk about is actually some of the opportunities in this particular field of research. And one of these opportunities is actually a new strategy for synthesizing nanomaterials for in vivo application. Um, and what that means is that one of the challenges people are facing right now is that people know that all nanoparticles, once you inject into the body, they will absorb onto some proteins. Even if you pegulate them, which was supposed to be the magic bullet to reduce um, protein absorption, a lot of studies that have now come out basically says that the pegulation, um, even though it, um, it reduces the amount of proteins absorbed to the surface, they still do absorb proteins on the surface. And some of the proteins they absorb are slightly different than uh, a long tag versus a short tag. Uh, the confirmation of the tag also determines uh, the kind of proteins that absorb on the surface. So one of the unique opportunities is that you may have a new strategy to synthesize nanomaterials um, for different applications. So here's an idea that we proposed a couple of years ago, which is that you take the patient and you extract blood out of the patient. And what you can do here is you take the blood, you, you, you purify to, to get your plasma, and then you take, for example, a gold nanoparticle, pre-code it with these proteins, and then what you can do is that you can split the sample up. So one strategy is that you can remove the gold nanoparticle, which then creates a protein shell, and then you can load it with different drugs, and then you can re-administer it into the patient. And so one of our strategies we think is that if you can use this approach, it's going to reduce the immune response of um, immune response of the patient to the nanoparticle. So that's one strategy. The other thing is that you may be able to isolate the nanoparticle and then you can um, keep it for biomarker analysis. You can actually analyze the proteins and the proteins may become a signature to identify the state of the disease that the patient may have, or it could also identify the state of the patient. So that's another possibility. And if you design your nanoparticles this way, you can actually make um, nanoparticles to selectively carry drugs. So in this paper we did um, that was just recently published, we put a protein, a strep and we actually overhanged it with uh, DNA sequences. So you can now think of using DNA as a loading strategy. So you, we, here in this case, we use a dye attached on DNA to use hybridization. And so you can get it into nanoparticles. So think about these uh, protein corona nanoparticles. You can now trap uh, DNA on the surface, you can RNA, you can place a different kind of uh, small molecule drug onto the surface as well. The other approach that we, we thought about is a technique that we call SIMBA, uh, serial injection of materials for biodistribution analysis. So what did we took nanoparticles and injected into the animal, and then we isolated the, uh, the nanoparticle out. Like in this case, for example, after they've been soaking for two hours, so they already acquired certain protein absorption. Then we digest out the gold nanoparticle, and then we cross-link the particles, load it with a dye in this case, and inject it back into an animal. What we found is that when we inject the nanoparticle into one animal with its circulation, 
and then we isolate the particles out and we inject it into a new animal, they actually behave exactly the same uh, in terms of the nanoparticle distribution as that is in the first animal. So what it is is that the protein corona, even though we don't know the details of what it can and cannot do, it's essentially behaving, uh, it's transporting the nanoparticle in the same manner in the first animal as the second animal. So it provides another opportunity in terms of designing nanoparticles by using the animal as a, uh, as a reactor to build up and make these nanoparticles. So the other opportunity that come into place is predicting the delivery of nanoparticles to tumors. Um, so our lab and others believe that uh, delivery remains low. And so we're actually trying to create a map where we're looking at particle characteristics, characteristic, which include the corona, disease characteristic, patient characteristic. And we're measuring things like bond distribution, pharma kinetic delivery efficiency, as well as therapeutic effect. And we're now trying to create computational algorithms to correlate these particular properties with the output properties. And what we think this is going to be important is it's going to be able to help guide the nano engineers to, to design the optimal nanoparticle formulations for the specific output, right? So distribution connects or delivery of therapeutic effects. So that's another opportunity. The third opportunity that will come into play is using the corona to diagnose patients. And the way you can do this is by, by looking at the protein profiling because the nanomaterials can actually select low abundant proteins. And these low abundant proteins can potentially become markers uh, for a certain disease. So we do not believe uh, that the disease marker is going to be one marker, two marker, but it's actually a library of markers. So again, the protein profiling allows you to get a library of what's going on in the bloodstream and collect information. And then you can use the, the, the protein composition as a predictor of a certain disease of patient. And we just show you this, right? We took eight patient samples, different ethnicity, different blood type, different age, and different sex. And you can see that using the same particles, they're actually pulling out different proteins that are absorbed onto the surface of the particle. And so the question is, how do you actually correlate this, uh, this pattern of proteins with a, with a certain disease of that particular patient? And that's what's being worked on in the lab. So future steps. So once that's done, what is the real big projects that is going to drive the field in the next couple of years? And so we think there's going to be three to four main areas. So the two to three is going to be local focus the next couple of years, and then it's going to really open up the application. I think the first uh, area of research that needs to be done is are the fundamental understanding the interface of nanomaterials with corona. So there's a lot of papers out there, but they tend to be very descriptors of the in interaction. So we need to actually create a better understanding with more specific details of binding affinity, binding constant, what proteins are involved with what, what receptors may be involved. And so we have to go through those studies in the next couple of years. What we also have to do is understand the effect of the nanoparticle chemical composition on corona composition. So there's still a lack of studies and, and data on things like liposomes, polymer particles, silica particles, on how those compositions affect the, um, the surface as our protein. So there's a lot of papers out there on that particular topic. And the challenge right now is that the groups that do those kind of work, they'll do like two to three studies and they move on to something else. So there's never enough of a study to allow you to actually see the evolution from that, those particular labs, right? And, and so it would be nice for those labs to start to do these profiling studies, very similar to what we've done, because then we can start to gather up all the information and start to do the, uh, the data analysis that looks across different chemical compositions. And that allows us to really develop better uh, algorithms and predictions as to what's uh, happening in the particle and to whether they're useful for diagnostics. So I think by doing one and two, it's going to create a better sense of broad reproducibility, right? So my lab, we get data in this particular way and we know how to process data. Other labs uh, may do it slightly different, which gets different results, right? And so that becomes a very important part of the equation is that we have to create reproducible in terms of what proteins absorb to the surface. Similarities in chemistry, similarities in design. So I think that's important. And the applications will come. Um, there are now a number of companies that are starting to develop the application aspect. Uh, cancer diagnostics is one very popular application. New nanomaterial design, we haven't started a company on it, but that's something that's been discussed. Uh, because now these are new types of nanomaterials that have very similar um, for chemistry, if you think about then some of the liposomes and then the polymer particles, but they're based on the, the unique uh, protein composition from the individual, right? So we think they will have some advantage. The other uh, project we've been debating about is actually um, taking liposomes 
and also coding that with these uh, serum proteins. And, and what's important about that is that if you can do that and the core is already followed, you don't want to process it the way we do gold nanoparticles. And you can build all the chemistries that we've been doing gold nanoparticles along the way. But again, the challenge that we have always felt dealing with liposomes in this topic is the purification, um, because the purification is just very difficult to do versus gold nanoparticles. So with that, I'd like to thank my group. So my group is the one who did a lot of these really, really nice work. And we've had now about 15 years of working on this, and we're slowly chugging along um, in terms of this area. Um, I know I didn't answer the questions that I was going to ask, like what specific proteins, how can you predict, but this is for us is a long range project and it's very important to do this. I just want to mention Zara, Johnny, and Presley. So they're members of the, uh, the Nanomedicine Innovation Network. So they're the ones who are now leading the effort in, in terms of the protein corona work. Uh, Johnny and Zara are doing uh, looking at the, the protein corona as it relates to uh, binding mm -hmm. affinity, binding absorption. And then Presley is developing some of the machine learning algorithm to try to correlate the corona with um, different distribution networks, uh, with how they dis how the network distribute in the tumors. And then through the years, we've had amazing people that worked on this project, uh, Jamie, Anthony, Shrey, and Wayne. So they're the ones who started a lot of the in vivo work um, on, on the rats and mice. And so we're going to extend that work on looking at tumor distribution. And I just want to broadly mention the fact is that um, a lot of the work we do in the lab is actually very collaborative. Um, we try to see people with uh, unique expertise that we don't have in my lab. So within Toronto, we have experts like Ian, who is in, in liver biology, Anton, who's a physicist, uh, helps us with some of our modeling scheme. Um, so they are, have been great in terms of uh, us building up this sort of uh, broader scheme of trying to develop nanoparticles for various medical applications. And we also have lots of collaborators outside of Toronto, um, just different expertise. So John Bishop uh, guided us in terms of some of the transport mechanisms. Some about diagnostics work, uh, we, we collaborate with Tom Egwan uh, out of Uganda uh, because of clinical sample and testing as well as Michael DeBosch at Roche. And also we are planning to start working with uh, Peter um, because we're starting to now look at some of the liposome formulations and try to understand some of the corona aspect of that, as well as some other studies we're doing looking at therapeutics. Um, so we try to find uh, people with the, the right expertise to, to help us move these projects forward. As well, I want to mention two of the people, uh, Shiresh and Michaela. They provided different animal models for some of our work. Michaela, um, we learned how to work on genetic engineered mouse models uh, from her lab. That's her, her specialty. Charette's uh, introduced uh, patient-derived uh, tumor models. So both of them, we brought some of those models to Toronto, and so they become uh, systems for us to, to play around with um, in terms of some of our studies. And as well, I'd like to thank uh, the funding support. Uh, through the years, we've done funding from CHR and Institute on these fundamental studies. And again, we were very appreciative of um, the, the Nanomedicine uh, Innovation Network for some of their studies on for funding some of our work on looking at the transport of nano, nanoparticles and corona predicting uh, tumor delivery, as well as other agencies. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have on the topic. Um, I'm going to call on Dr. Cullis because I know he had a question. So uh, Dr. Cullis, are you in a position to uh, speak to your question or would you like me to read it out? Uh, yes. Can you hear me all right? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. Um, I just want to ask Warren. The um, you know there are some things in the circulation in the you know in the circulation in the body that circulate for a long time. For example, erythrocytes, which will circulate for 120 days. Um, has the protein corona uh, the, 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 the <clears throat> been um, analyzed for for erythrocytes? It'd be kind of interesting to see what kind of composition. Uh, the uh, the erythrocyte uh, membrane has, or at least uh, the corona of the erythrocyte membrane. So the answer to that is no, but that would be a valid uh, project to work on. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is that the way we look at it is uh, uh, anything that's floating around in the blood, we think proteins, ions, lipids, and other things stick onto their surface. And sometimes those things that stick on the surface has an impact, other times it does not, right? And we're just starting the process at this point. And so like the method we did for the mass spec analysis, that technique has, was only available around 2010 or 11, right? And so we are one of the first groups to use it. So at that time, there was very few universities with such a system. Now it's much more common. And so some of these questions about erythrocytes, uh, those other formulations that we're interested in can be done now. And my lab, 
uh, as well as uh, two labs, one in Germany, two labs in Germany, have very much standardized on their mass spec analysis. So it's actually not that hard to run as long as the purification is not hard. All right, thank you. Thank you for the question as well. Marshall, do we have any other questions um, for Dr. Chan? We have, yes, quite a string of written questions have gathered. Okay. So I'll start with, with the first to receive from Roy Patti Peiluhu, who wrote, evolution has led to proteins having very specific binding interactions with other proteins or biomolecules. In your model of multiple layers of proteins on top of the nanoparticle, how do you address the large amount of protein-protein interactions that are not expected or rationally explained? So that's a good question. Um, very difficult question um, to, to answer. And the reason for that is because we're just starting to look at the protein-protein interaction on the surface of the nanoparticle. Um, and so what we're gonna do, uh, one of the next things we're gonna do is actually uh, get a specialist in protein-protein um, in interaction and we're hoping that they will eventually work with us to map these interactions. Um, and then we have to develop new techniques to test that. Right? And it's going, to be comp it's going to be pretty complicated as we start to go into the details. All right, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Ridhima Junija. Would you, would, will the use for processes such as microfluidics, a print technique for NP production help to overcome the challenge number two related to reproducibility, considering the issue is related to batch reproducibility? Should we expect to see better correlation in these studies if nanoparticles are produced using the above techniques? Yeah, so, so the issue here is that the issue is whether this is batch reproducibility or not. And the answer to that is that I don't actually know the, the answer to that. So we're debating right now that the reasoning to variable corona is either the batch reproducibility or the method or analysis, or there's slight variability in terms of the synthetic process. Um, so once we figure it out, then I think we can figure out a method to get around it. But I think at the end, in the bigger picture, is that the corona analysis has to be part of the Q, uh, quality um, Q&A in terms of assessment of nanoparticles, because every time you make a formulation, you make slight changes, it's going to have slight changes in the proteins that are absorbed on the surface. And I do hope that the print technology can solve that. I mean, that's a very, I've been following that technology for many years, and they actually asked me, Long time ago, the company that, that developed it uh, asked me to, to consult a little bit um, around 2008 or 9, I think at that time, right? And, and the reason that they were interested in these kind of questions, um, but then management changed and things changed, right? So we do, it's going to be a chemistry issue eventually. Right now, it's more of an interfacial issue, which is where we're at. All right, thank you. Marshall, additional question? Yes, uh, Dr. Hagar Labuta has raised her hand. so. Dr. Labuda, I'm going to unmute you from our end. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. Go ahead. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding, uh, like, one of the projects uh, that uh, Dr. Chan, you, like you did, was uh, defining the, the protein that binds to the receptor. I find this very interesting. And one of the, your hypotheses was actually def, like defining different, different layers of the protein corona, like foundation layer, assembly layer, and binding layer. So how would you um, distinguish between whether a protein binds to a receptor or not, and whether it's actually location within these layers would really uh, uh, come in play with uh, receptor interaction? And I have another question uh, regarding the zeta potential, because uh, you mentioned that, uh, it, uh, like, whatever the, 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 the charge of the nanoparticles, it ends up with a negative charge. And this is very interesting, especially if we think about other nanoparticles, like if this would be generalizable to other nanoparticles, especially uh, cationic uh, lipid particles that are actually needed and uh, developed for uh, applications regarding gene delivery and other applications. Uh, thank you. So the first one is how do you actually determine how the uh, the layer interacts with our receptors? So that's actually a long-term project. So the first thing you have to do for that project is to identify the receptors that's involved in that process. 
And then once you're done with the receptors, you work backwards to figure out what the ligands are. And then once you figure the ligands, then you can actually pick up a map of how the ligands are positioned. So you, I think the next step in that area is the receptor identification, but also the ligands and to develop a sort of a protein protein map of how the proteins are situated, right? And then that's essentially how you, you do that. And then once you do that, you have to develop some sort of a screening approach. And the screening approach then allows you to identify which, uh, which receptor, which ligands are in the outermost layer of the nanoparticle that will relate to the binding interaction of cells. And that's like a five to 10 year project, but it's very critical because it starts to relate the architecture to what receptors they're binding to. And in terms of the cationic lipid nanoparticle, that's a fabulous topic, right? Because one of the conceptions or thoughts is that the reason cationic lipid nanoparticles or polymer particles uh, interact very well uh, with cells is that uh, the cell cytoplasm tends to be negative charge. But one of the, the mechanisms out there is that the positive charge drives the, um, the, the nanoparticles into the cell cytoplasm. But we're actually thinking that that is not the real mechanism. The mechanism is that you have a positive charge cationic lipid nanoparticle. It binds to certain serum proteins. And those proteins are what drives in. So with a positive and negative charge uh, lipid nanoparticle, they bind and stick onto different sets of proteins. And those proteins are mediators of that transport process. And that's something I, I wish somebody would, would study. Um, I, I, you know, it's funny, I, you know, I, I think you're uh, from Dave's lab, right? And Dave and yes. I talked about that in 2010 or 11 as a really interesting study, right? And we started writing grant on it and then everyone got busy and then we never focused on that, right? Because the Canada lipid networks are very important for a lot of applications. And we were just both asking why that was happening, right? Okay, thank you. I wish I, I could have a question, like an answer to Dave, but <laughs> unfortunately not. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for the, for the talk. Thank you. So we now have a question from Sad Megahead. Do you think working with zwitterionic surfaces could help in avoiding or minimizing the effect of corona? So the answer is yes. So if you work in zwitterionic uh, nanocoding, what it does is that it actually reduces the probability of interaction between the serum proteins and the surface of the particle. They still do interact with each other. So it's just not maybe as sticky. So if you look at stickiness, uh, you know, if it's really sticky, meaning that it's going to be on the surface for permanent long term, if it's weakly interacted, it still can interact with the surface and can still alter the, uh, the fate of the particle. And we don't really know what. And that's what the most important next project is to figure out the binding affinity. You convert this to a chemical system. Then you have that information, and that allows you now to make these studies down the line that allows you to figure that out. All right, thank you. Marshall, do we have time for another question? Okay, uh, the next comes from Gabrielle Manvel, who writes, fabulous talk, I really enjoyed it. I would like to know a bit more about your findings from the beginning of the talk, that the overall charge of the nanoparticles becomes negative in all cases. Why do you think that happens and what do you think the implications are of that? Yeah. Oh, so. So the answer is that we were very surprised by that. We thought that we would see a delineation based on the starting chemistry of the nanoparticles. And so we think it's because if you have something that's positive, it's gonna stick onto certain proteins and some of those proteins may be negative. For, I'll give an example, albumin is negative. So if you stick to a protein that's negative in, in a pH of seven, the whole particle now becomes negative, right? And so what that tells me is that the predominant proteins that are on the surface tends to be slightly negative. You might have some cationic uh, proteins, but overall you have more negative charge than positive charge. So the, the question that was um, uh, that was presented by uh, Dr. Labuta is really the, the implication, right? Because when we're designing our system, we're thinking about designing a cationic uh, particle for transport itself is a charge, charge interaction. But what we're saying here is that it's not the charge that dictates this, but it's actually the proteins that dictate this. So then that would actually you may change how you design your nanoparticle system. And that's the impact, right? Because if you think your mechanism works one way, but it works slightly differently, then what happens is that you know you can change all your chemical parameters, but it may not work the way you design. But if you understand the interface, that interface then helps you design it the way you want to, right? And that's the future. It's really an engineering process, and that information helps the engineering precision. All right, thank you. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more short question. Uh, this is from Anish Thacker. 
Can corona proteins interfere with the biological function of adsorbed proteins on nanoparticles? That's a good question. And I hope someone does that study. So the answer is I don't know. Um, so one of the, the, the really cool projects someone should work on is look at how enzymes absorb the surface and how the enzymatic function gets altered when it's on corona. So these, all these projects are, are also in our head as well. It's just that you don't have so many capacity to, to do all of them. But they're fantastic questions. We're almost at time here. So Dr. Chan, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for delivering the April 2021 Enmin Lecture. And to today's participants, thank you for joining us and for all your excellent questions.